Socks on 35th is next. Doors open on the left. How's it going, everybody? My name is Duke Coughlin, and welcome to the Socks on 35th podcast. We are back with another exciting episode covering your Chicago White Sox. As always, I'm joined by our panelists, Jordan Lazowski and Nick Gower. Gentlemen, I hope you enjoyed your Memorial Day weekend. How are you guys doing? Oh, I and I enjoyed my weekend a lot. And then I came back, got into the groove of, you know, you know, got to get ready for work tomorrow. Got to sit down and watch the White Sox again. Um, so overall doing well. A um, little unfortunate the news we'll be talking about in terms of this team today, but is what it is. Yeah, I think it's funny how you frame watching the White Sox alongside with getting ready for work. Like it's an obligation, not something you're excited to do. <laughs> I'm not saying I disagree. It like I, I feel the same way. It's just it's sad that it's, you know, technically, you know, like end of May, beginning of June and we we already feel this way. Yeah, I'm sitting there I'm like, are you gonna tell me that I'm wrong? Like <laughs> <laughs> No, I mean it's it's definitely like a pretty even battle for like the work emails I'm already seeing come in that I'm going to have to answer tomorrow and what the White Sox are doing. It's kind of this even like, gosh, I've never had Sunday scary so bad for a Monday. So, you know, it is. What yeah, it I'm is. like, hmm, maybe I should just answer the work emails tonight. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But then you, then you send them and you get the auto replies from like 30 different people that are included <laughs> in the email. It's a it's a nightmare replying to anybody during a holiday weekend. Let me tell you. Um, but anyway. It's great to hear you guys. Enjoyed your weekends. Um, we have quite a bit to cover in this episode, but before we get started, be sure to subscribe to the podcast on Apple, Spotify, YouTube, and anywhere else you get your podcasts. Also, be sure to check out the website at Socks on 35th, as well as following us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Socks on 35th. Um, just jumping right in, obviously, um, the Guardians and the Detroit series were um, kind of what happened this week. Obviously, we did not get the results we wanted, specifically in the Detroit series. Um you know, just kind of, just kind of opening thoughts from you guys. Uh, Nick, I'll let you kind of take it off the top. Yeah, I mean, obviously a very frustrating week. I think that going one and three against the Tigers, while everyone is correct to say it's unacceptable and, you know, the team has to be better. Of course, I agree. But at the same time, we're talking about a team that also went one and three in Kansas City a couple of weeks ago. Like, it's not that crazy, especially while Detroit... I know they've been outperforming a lot of their peripherals, but they've been a better team than the White Sox. Like I, I'm not saying it's time we accept that that's the case going forward, but it's not the biggest surprise either that you lose a series to a team that has a better record than you on the road. That's one thing. But in terms of the actual performance in the team, um, I do want to start out by talking about Pedro Grifo a little bit. And to be clear, I'm not, I'm not saying that it's his fault that the team is doing poorly or that you know he should be on the hot seat or anything crazy like that. It's way too early in his in his tenure. But at the same time, he is um, keeping on some trends that I find a little bit concerning. For example, one thing is he manages the bullpen a lot uh, more similar to Tony La Russa than I thought he would, in the sense that unless you have someone like uh, Jesse Schultons uh, coming in after an opener, the relievers pretty much always pitch one inning, no matter what, even if it's like Kendall Graveman over the weekend who threw six pitches and probably could have gone back out for a second. He's done it before. Um, and I'm not saying that's why we lost that game. It's still it just it's not great for your relievers and from a rest standpoint if they're throwing you know six to twelve pitch innings all the time and then that's it. I'm not again I'm not suggesting Joe Kelly be pitching multiple innings, but you have several guys um, Lopez Lambert. I mean I know Lambert just got hurt, but Lopez Lambert, Graveman even a little bit. Hendricks once he gets his legs under him and you know gets in better shape, you have plenty of guys who have gone several innings before and they're just they just don't do it really. So I'm not I'm kind of puzzled why outside of you know, shoulders and I guess crochet a little bit why we haven't seen that. Yeah. I'll piggyback off of that. I was very confused by in, excuse me, the series finale, I believe it was. Oh yes. It was the series finale in Detroit. Um, the decision to let Graveman only throw six pitches and then Joe, send Joe Kelly out there after he just threw a lot of pitches the night before and didn't really look great. Uh, I was very confused by that decision. I think it's one of those where it's like, you know, some of them you're like, oh, Griffon, new manager, I'm not going to get too bent out of shape when this team's 11 under 500. This isn't his problem, or his it's his problem. It's not necessarily his fault. That's one that was completely controllable. I felt like, you know, at least have Joe Kelly ready if Graveman just really doesn't look good in that second inning. Um but at least let Graveman go back out there on six pitches. They hit a couple ground balls. That's exactly what he is supposed to be doing. And he started as 
the closer once Lopez struggled a little bit. So it's like, it's not that he wasn't comfortable going to him in the ninth inning. Um, other than that, that Detroit series was just brutal. Call it what it is. They had that nice 12 run outburst against a guy with an eight ERA. Otherwise it was more of the same. And I think that's, what's most frustrating about all of this. More of the same from the second half of 2021 to 2022 to 2023. Offense is not doing its job and hasn't for a very long time. You can blame whatever you want to blame. I think it's worth digging into it deeper. But the reality is they just have not gotten the job done. And that's why they're sitting where they're at right now. You know, and I think I think Rafal is kind of following into a, a similar trap to that a lot of managers do, especially when they have a struggling bullpen where guys really aren't kind of holding their end of the deal. When you get a guy who just went on the run that Joe Kelly went on, he is the first guy on your mind when you have any sort of like a high leverage situation that you want to put him in. Um, you know, and I, I would say Kendall Graveman was kind of that guy last year that we were always kind of like, oh, this is a perfect opportunity for Kendall Graveman. Anytime it was a high leverage situation, I swear it was always Kendall Graveman. That was the, that was the guy everyone wanted in at that point. And now it's kind of turned into Joe Kelly. You know, with with your point that you were making, Jordan, you know, he'd thrown a lot of pitches, even even throughout that stretch. It felt like Joe Kelly was kind of pitching every day or anytime we were in a close ball game, he was pitching. So, you know, eventually it was going to hit a point where Joe was just not going to be able to control what he wanted over the plate. He was going to have some hangers, which was kind of what happened. Um, and, you know, he was just going to have, have a stinker. That happens when you're in the bullpen. You know, it, it's even the best relievers have those uh, have those stretches. Um, it's all about Grafal knowing when to use him. Um, this is where like using a Joe Kelly in a game where we have like a four or five run lead where it just, it, it really continues to hurt. You know, I'm not saying he necessarily did that this week, but it's something that he's done in the past that is still very worrisome until we see him consistently not do that. Um, and it's definitely something to keep an eye on uh, moving forward. But, you know, I, I think, uh, I think a lot of the fan base um, is kind of starting to see things with Pedro Grafal. Maybe some aren't saying it as loudly as others, because, I think a lot of people are just happy for anybody not named Tony La Russa, And I feel like they were going to be happy for anybody not named Tony La Russa. Uh, but at a certain point, you have to be able to objectively look at it and uh, really see what's happening and where Grafal is messing up. Right. I mean, the reality is, too, like, like when you have a struggling bullpen, the problem is they don't right now. Like the bullpen is probably the only consistently good thing they have going for them right now. I mean, Joe Kelly had that one bad outing. Other than that, it's been good. So you you... As a manager, you have to be able to sit and as managers, if I really know. But the expectation of a manager is to react to the situation in front of you and say, hmm, all right, I just had a guy who threw six pitches and I got a guy who threw yesterday and got lit up for the first time all season. Is it an outlier? Probably. Is a one run lead in a series I need to split the time to find out? Probably not. I'll save it for the Anaheim series. And worst case scenario, I have to go to Kelly once Graveman lets up a base runner or something like that. Like, there were better ways to plan things. I think that's the reality of this entire situation a lot of times with the fault. There's, it's not the most glaring problem ever, but there were better alternatives that should have been explored. Yeah, completely agree. And taking a bit of a turn away from the bullpen onto the position player side of things, I'll be really interested to see how Grifo manages in the coming weeks now that Eloy Jimenez is back because you basically have, I mean, minus Oscar, Oscar Colas is in AAA, you basically have the full contingent of players you expected to have prior to the season, minus Elvis Andrews too, but he's uh, probably coming back in the coming days. So now that Grifo will have this you know, full roster, it'll be interesting to see how he uses his guys, so to speak whether you think that's Hans or Alberto or Romy Gonzalez, if he stays on the roster when Elvis comes back. Uh, even Clint Frazier, not not a Griffo guy, I would say, but someone who's a bench piece who's been actually performing well. I think that Griffo's actually done a pretty good job for the most part when it comes to not overdoing it on the rest days. I know people have been annoyed by um, <clears throat> by Luis Robert or Yo Moncada sitting here and there, but it's nothing compared to last year where you basically had you know two or three bench players in the lineup every single day. So going forward, I want to see, you know, if Alberto doesn't get DFA'd, and I'm assuming that he won't get DFA'd because Griffo loves him, how often is he going to play? How often is he going to start over someone like Jake Berger? Hopefully never, but it's going to happen. So that, that's something I want to monitor going forward. Two things on that front. Number one, um, 
you know, even if Clint Frazier isn't one of Pedro Grafal's guys, I am a Clint Frazier guy. Like, I, I have been on this with a couple other guys. I, I am very excited about that. And maybe it's false hope in the stretch of a long, long season, but I've enjoyed Clint Frazier's time so far. Um, but other than that, I think as you try and manage all of this, it's a good question, Nick. And, and I... I Hesitate to suggest it, but it's like at what point, especially I hesitate to suggest it after he just homered in the Angels game on Monday. What is the probability that Andrew Vaughn starts to lose some at bats? At a certain point, he's got about 100 weighted runs created plus, dead league average. Sure, it's better than Jose Abreu right now, but that's not saying much. Like when you know you have a stacked roster full of first basemen. It feels like the Sox still don't have a first baseman right now where it's like Berger might be the one sheets is on and off. It's like, and Vaughn just hasn't looked great. You can make an argument that Vaughn should start to lose some at bats um, as this team gets healthy and they start figuring out their second base situation. It's a weird place to be in, but I think it is you continue to look up and down this offense. One guy that, should get pointed out. It's it's just another top draft pick, Andrew Vaughn's sort of average performance that that really can't hold up given um or needs to be better given that he plays a premium power position. Yeah, no, and it's it's a situation where you know Gavin Sheets being up and down as he is has really kind of made it difficult for Andrew Vaughn not to get at bats taken away from him. Um, if Gavin were to be a little bit more consistent, I feel like it would be a lot less of a conversation. Um, also him being a, a pretty large liability against lefties also kind of hurts his, his, you know, chances with that. But, you know, to the Jake Berger point, I just don't see a situation where he shouldn't be in the lineup every day. I, I really don't care where he is at this point. Um, whether he's at DH, which honestly with, uh, Knock on wood, if Aloy, if Aloy were to stay healthy playing right field, that would honestly be a very ideal type situation because then you'd be able to have Jake Berger in the lineup every day at DH because he can hit both righties and lefties. Um, then you do have Gavin Sheets who could potentially, you know, give Aloy a day off or give Berger a day off or give Vaughn a day off. It's just it's a it's such a hodgepodge of a situation right now that is really difficult to kind of read where we're going to go with it. Um, while I don't agree, like, I mean, I don't disagree with Andrew Vaughn potentially getting less at bats. Um, I just really feel like, you know, we're going to get the Rick Hahn, you know, he was a high draft pick, you know, he, we're going to give him, we're going to give him the time to figure it out type thing. Um, and that's, that's where we're going to kind of see, uh, how much, how much, uh, Griffal really wants to hold a guy like that accountable. And, you know, the thing with Vaughn is like, he, his RBI numbers really aren't all that bad. And it, he's really streaky as well. But I swear, every time we start to really think, like, what is Andrew Vaughn doing? He just will kind of have a good game or two, and it kind of quiets it for a minute. Um, but, yeah, I don't know. It's going to be something interesting to watch. It just is really hard with the way our roster is built right now. Um, you know, obviously, Elvis Andrews coming back is going to be a positive. Um, we're going to need him to really start kind of picking it up from where he was early on in the season because that type of production just isn't going to be able to stick for the rest of the year. Um yeah, it's it's definitely an interesting situation to watch, um, and it's going to be interesting to see how Pedro Grafal kind of uh, maneuvers the entire situation. Um, I do like you bringing up Clint Frazier, though. I, I listen, man. I, I always love the high end prospects getting the second chance, and uh, seeing him succeed right now with the White Sox is awesome. I, it's probably his fool's gold, but I'm all the way in on Clint Frazier, Frazier as well. I hope he hope he finds a way to stick on the roster. And I mean, the reality is people like make fun of, oh, Rick Hahn signing failed prospects and oh, look at the 2017. He looked at the 2017 um, top prospects list and just taking all those guys. Wouldn't you rather take a chance on those types of guys? Look at the Angels and Mickey Moniak, that, that sort of deal. Like, would you rather take a chance on those guys or continue to sign the Jake Marisnicks of the world? You can do both. You should do both. But it's not like you can be super critical of it's like, oh, this guy with really good bat speed, really good plate discipline became available. You know, we don't have anyone burning down the doors to get at bats at the major league level. Let's try him. I, it's what any team does. And it's just like, it's ridiculous. The reaction some of these guys get again, it's probably fool's gold, but anything he can provide in terms of, especially plate discipline is like, is very welcome on a team like this. Yeah, I completely agree. When you sign someone like Clint Frazier rather than using an Adam Hazley or Jake Marisnik, 
the way I look at it is when you sign a career major leaguer like Marisnik, who's now kind of, you know, winding down, there's maybe a 5% chance that he comes up to your major league roster and is good enough to actually stay there, whether it's via defense, speed, whatever. And there's a 95% chance that he does it. And of course, with Marisnik, he's already been DFA'd and outright it to he's back in Charlotte. But I would be surprised if we saw him again, barring a lot, a lot of injuries. Whereas with Frazier, sure, it's still, you know, a pretty low chance, probably still under 10% that he's good enough the whole year that he sticks on your roster. But there's also that tantalizing, you know, like one or 2% chance that he not only is good enough to stick on your roster, but he sticks around for more than one year. And I'm not saying he's going to develop into a starting player or anything, but there's a non-zero chance. And you can't really say that about someone who's a 33-year-old journeyman like the team usually acquires. So it's really, it's, it's so minor. Again, we're talking about a couple percentage points here, but it's just refreshing to see because I'm watching a game and watching Clint Frazier take a you know professional discipline at bat and thinking, hey, at least this guy is up there with a plan and it's not a 32-year-old who has a career 600 OPS who clearly is not a good hitter. Like with Frazier, there's upside. And as much as it's unrealistic that that upside comes to fruition, it exists and it's different than what they're currently doing. Well, you know, at the end of the day, and I think this is something that a lot of people really underrate, um, you just need professionals on the on the on the roster, you know, and like, you know, like you said, if this is a situation where Clint Frazier could stick around for a year or two, those types of guys, they're good to have in the clubhouse. They're good to be able to jump, like throw out there to start for a day. They're good to be able to, you know, take a pinch hit in a, in an ideal situation where they match up. Well, you know, I, I feel like a lot of people always, always expect so much from the bench guys, you know, thinking like, Oh, they need to come in and immediately put starter caliber production up. You know, if a guy gets injured or anything like that and having a Clint Frazier, that's that's just a solid a solid guy you know it's a solid guy to have on a bench um jordan i know you can attest to this having those types of guys on a baseball team you know to be able to just kind of toss out there any given day um it, it's it's a good problem to have you know and and especially with him having as much discipline at the plate that he does um if you need if you need a guy to be able to get on base in a situation late in the game it's it's nice to kind of have that in your back pocket right and the reality is at a certain point the White Sox need guys like this to spring up out of nowhere and contribute uh, on the offensive side. On the pitching side, they seem to do that pretty well. You know, it's all the fire Ethan cats and all that crap. Yeah, yeah, whatever. I get it. The reality is they end up finding decent guys every once in a while. They've made something out of Lambert. Gregory Santos was a nice ad. Those types of guys that, that they don't really have on the offensive side of the ball and really haven't outside of what Brian Goodwin for a couple weeks stretch back in 2021. Like, they haven't had someone at a certain point to come in and add offensively. So it's, it's nice when someone comes up like this and contributes because it's like, you know, we haven't seen someone who's willing to walk like 15% of the time. And it becomes exciting because, like, well, where has this been elsewhere from other players? It's why players like him should probably continue to get shots because – what alternative do they have right now? Continuing to run out the same over and over and over again without change. It's, it's how you end up 23 and 33 and just really struggling to find anything. Yeah. And I, and I will, I will give Griffal credit. He has been pretty good about keeping the roster kind of fluid, keeping new fresh guys in the, in the clubhouse to see who's going to produce and who doesn't. We haven't seen a situation, you know, besides maybe a Lenin Sosa just because of, you know, we kind of needed him at the time a guy that kind of came up struggled pretty mightily, you know, and then, you know, he didn't really hang around all that long. Um, it, it's been, it's been good to kind of rotate these guys out to see who's going to be playing at a major league level, you know, and that's, that's smart. And I think more teams need to be able to kind of do that, especially if, if you have the options to be able to do that, you know, if you already have them, you know, on, on your main roster to be able to kind of mess around with sending them back to Charlotte and bringing them back up. Um, it's just smart. Um, you know, and I do like that you brought up the pitchers, you know, and I do, yeah, I know we, definitely uh hyped up the starting pitchers last week on the pod um obviously not the greatest week for him um feels like everybody kind of struggled um this would be my moment where i would highlight michael kopech for having an incredible week um had a little bit of a rough start against the angels on monday but ended up working out of it was only giving up four runs um and that's with giving all of that up in the first inning um so definitely a, a bounce back type of per, uh, performance where kopech in the past would have definitely folded under the pressure of that um, so yeah, you know, Michael Kopech, uh, potentially, you know, 
could be a guy that uh, could really, really end up helping us down the line if he continues to bring up this production. Obviously, we need Dylan Cease to kind of match that as well. Um, overall, and uh, Nick, I'll, I'll let you kind of jump on this. Um, how are you feeling about the pitching rotation currently? Um, what are some adjustments you think some of these guys could potentially make to uh, kind of turn it around? Yeah, I mean, I feel a lot better now than I did in April, that's for sure. And I think that with Kopech in particular, like, yes, he allowed four runs against the Angels in the first inning, and he was missing his spots like crazy at certain points. But he also had 10 strikeouts out of the 13 outs he recorded. Like, that's pretty good, right? I, I know it's a silver lining, but it's nice to see him missing bats again the way he did even in 2021. Uh, so that's, that's one. But another thing is that I think – when you talk about Dylan Cease, and I'm not, I'm not one of those people who's like he was a one year wonder. It's all over. I'm not saying that. But what concerns me about him is, and I guess I can phrase this as a question. I'm assuming Jordan will jump in next. Last year, and even 2021, when Cease was kind of like you know a very good but not elite pitcher, he was missing bats, and he was walking a lot of guys, kind of like the Dylan Cease we know. But also when he was getting hit, he wasn't getting hit very hard. And what concerns me about this year is that. He has a 49.2% hard hit rate right now, which is in the bottom 6% of the league, according to Baseball Savant. And his average exit velocity has gone from 86 to 91 miles per hour year over year, which is a pretty big jump. And my guess is that it might have something to do with the fact that his fastball is cutting more uh, like it did earlier in his career. But my counter to that guess would be earlier in his career, he wasn't getting hit this hard, even when it was cutting. So Jordan, I guess I'll ask you this. What do you think about that? The way that Dylan sees it's getting hit and how do you feel about him going forward? I think it's a function of a couple things. The first being, yeah, the fastball is not as lively as it was last year. It's not as bad as it's been in the past, but it's not as lively as it was in 2022. And I think that's a big part of it. And the, the rest of it is kind of exactly what happened to cease in 2020, 2021. It's like when you don't, have pinpoint stuff or even when you don't have stuff that can routinely command the zone guys just key up on things like they, they can bite on sliders away because they see if they see a slider start on the outside corner they know it's going to fall off so they don't even have to worry about that they're going to force you to come to the middle of the plate um it's the same thing with the fastball if they see it start at a certain level they know it's kind of just staying up there it's not really a good pitch to hit they can leave it go same thing with sliders low. If you can't really command anything well, hitters just zone up and force you to come to the middle of the plate, or they'll take four or five walks a game, which teams have not had an issue doing against him. I think that's what it comes back to. I think, you know, he's mentioned not feeling totally in sync. I, I think that's what fans really don't understand is how, yeah, it's easy to diagnose. Oh, yes, he's cutting his fastball. But the reality is there are such micro movements that go into that. Um, it makes it it makes it so much harder to change in a five day stretch between starts than I think fans will really give credit to. Because at the, at the end of the day, we don't know it as much as the players do. And again, it's if you have any understanding of biomechanics and anything like that. These are all just very small things that need to change, and it's very hard to do that. And I think the professional in him has allowed it from getting terrible at times, limiting it to four runs worth of damage. Um, but it's still nowhere near where he needs to be. Um, and I think that's still going to take time. So I, I think you touched on some of the more important parts, especially when it comes to um, really, you know, I think people get a lot a lot of the wrong idea about Dylan. Um being a dominant pitcher doesn't necessarily mean you can paint the corners, you know, and that's something that Dylan's never really been all that great, great with. And that's why he gets as much velocity on his fastballs because he kind of lets it loose a little bit. And it just seems like he's having a lot of diff, a lot, a lot more difficulty controlling it this year compared to years past. Um, and, you know, as a pitcher, when you kind of get stuck into that situation, you know, you know, I, I like that you brought up like the professional in him. And this is, this is being a professional athlete in any sport you're told you don't want to overcorrect something when you think you're doing something wrong because it can just make it about a hundred times worse. Um, and I think that's where Dylan's at. You know, I think, I think you bring up a great point of, you know, not being able to just kind of make an adjustment immediately. You might be able to identify it, but making that adjustment. So you're not over overcorrecting it is an entirely different story. You know what I mean? And that's a lot of what I've been seeing with Dylan as well. Um, I think, I think pitch selection, 
does have something to do with it like as well. I think with how he's not being able to control his fastball right now, I think he should just go a little bit more to his movement because even if he can't control that, like, dude, a Dylan Cease not being able to control a slider is still disgusting. You know, I don't think there's any, any debate about that. You know what I mean? Um, and I think that's something where he needs to get a little bit more comfortable just being like, okay, I can't control my fastball right now. I'm still going to need to throw it because I can't be predictable. Otherwise, these guys are just going to sit slider. But I need to start going heavier with my slider in this start, you know. And, you know, who knows? Maybe he's already doing that. But just from what I'm seeing from where I'm sitting, you know, and like I said, I'm not a pitching coach or anything like that. I pitched in high school and middle school for a little bit. But I don't think that makes me an expert by any stretch of the imagination. But um, I just don't think you want to over adjust and potentially really throw yourself off. So I think Dylan's trying to kind of just gradually get control of his fastball, try to mix in more of his sliders um, without becoming too predictable because of how much he's throwing his fastball right now. There's a lot of guys that are just kind of sitting fastball because um, they don't know if Dylan's either trying to change his splits. He's trying to make, maybe not be as much be as predictable with his slider. Um, I think this might be something that he went into during the off season about potentially, you know, not being the slider first pitcher because then guys are just going to sit slider on you. Um, but you know, that's, that's all, uh, that's all speculation, but I, I do think, uh, with, with what you were saying, that's really important in that point is this isn't something that he can just fix overnight. Um, and it's not something you really want him to try to fix overnight. Cause otherwise you have a Dylan C that can go out there that will just flat out miss the strike zone and throw hangers over the plate, you know, even worse than he is right now. And it sucks, right? Like, you know, he's good and he knows he's good. And the reality is everyone's like, oh, he was one year wonder. It's like. You can't like there are numbers to prove from just the movement standpoint, all that stuff. There are numbers to prove it's incorrect and it's frustrating, but it's still frustrating at the same time to see that this is what this player is going through after having such a great year. The problem is with all of this for me, and I feel like especially recently, the pitching staff has gotten so, 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 so much heat. Some of it deserved. Absolutely. If you look at the, this team's record, by and this is me trying to take a little bit of heat off the pitching staff and place it elsewhere. If you look at the team's record by the number of runs scored in a game, no runs, one run, two run, pretty good. If they score three runs, they're only five and four. Or excuse me, runs like this is runs allowed, not runs scored. Excuse me, zero runs allowed, one run allowed, two runs allowed, pretty good. Three runs allowed, they're five and four. Four runs allowed, they're three and five. Five runs, they're one and four. The, and then you can get into the bigger problem, which is they've allowed six or more runs in 21 games. That's an issue. That's where the pitching staff still gets the, um, the, the criticism it deserves, is that 21 games, six or more runs that's allowed, that's ridiculous. The rest of it, 9 and 13 on games in which you allow three to five runs. If your pitcher has a bad start, it, the game's over in four innings. Like, that's how it's been for the White Sox this season. The game in Detroit was an exception because they kind of bailed bad, even though they lost that series finale. It's kind of an exception. A pitcher has a bad start. Um, the, the offense kind of battles back and bails them out. Three or four runs down is, like, completely insurmountable for this team right now. You force your pitching staff, starters, relievers, to be perfect when your offense is not holding up its end of the bargain. And for as much as everyone wants to focus on, oh, what's wrong with Cease? Oh, Kopech's doing this and this. Oh, Giolito looks like a bust after seven walks. Whatever everybody wants to say, Lynn's cooked, whatever. And again, 21 games, six more runs allowed. That's a problem. At the same time, they have painted themselves in a corner as an offense where you're forcing your pitching staff to be perfect. That is just as much of a problem. Yeah, for sure. I think that kind of reminds me of the Caesars, not necessarily just the White Sox, but throughout baseball, maybe a team that plays a lot of close games, like, you know, three to two kind of games. And whenever they lose them, a lot of people question the manager and say, well, the manager should have done this or should have done that. And maybe they're right. Maybe they have a point. But at the same time, it's like maybe the team should score more than two runs. Like, that's kind of how I feel. And when Giolito pitched the other night and walked seven batters in Detroit, Jordan, like you said, I mean, it's frustrating because he is having such a good year overall. This was, you know, kind of a blip when you look at the larger, larger picture. And when he allows four runs, like you said, it feels like the game's over. And on a, a better team, frankly, maybe you end up winning that game six to four. 
and the story after the game as well. The offense was resilient. They, you know, were patient. They came back. They, you know, had a couple of big hits. Great. But instead, the story is Lucas Giolito has his, you know, worst control than he started this year. And who knows, maybe it's the start of a bad trend for him. Like, it kind of takes pressure off your pitchers, not just in the fact that you're winning a game, but in that now the narratives and now the focus is not on his performance. Like, Giolito's performance would have been an afterthought had they won the game. Even though you could argue it shouldn't be, it would have been. So they just never seem to bail their pitchers out. And I'm sure someone can pull up, oh, it happened on, you know, May 12th or something. But it doesn't happen often enough, not nearly as often as it did, you know, even two years ago. And that's definitely frustrating. I think, Jordan, your overall point seems to be that the offense deserves more blame than it gets, if I'm understanding. And if that's true, then I completely agree. Yeah, it does. And I tweeted out a couple days ago, if you look at the statistical comparison for the White Sox between April and May, April was horrendous. May has been pretty good. A little bit above 500. The offensive statistics have not changed. They're still bottom third of the league in nearly every offensive category. So the pitching staff is holding this team afloat right now. And when they're not perfect, which it's going to happen, you're not going to have your best stuff every single one of your 32 starts. You have painted this pitching staff in a corner where you have to be perfect or you have to make the exact right decision on a bullpen decision that Grafal has to make. The offense needs somebody needs to in that in that offense be like we got to step up we got to do something we have got to hold up our end of the bargain. I, I think Jesse Schultons the other day he gave him gave him like almost five innings of two run ball as a guy filling in for Clevenger. You should win that game and they lost it like that's a problem and that's a, it's just a larger trend for this team where the pitching seems to get a lot more of the criticism without an equal amount going towards that offensive side. Yeah. I mean, as, as far as a guy just off the top of my head, you know, maybe, maybe fanboying a little bit here, uh, Aloy Jimenez, obviously uh, sitting on a 10 game hitting streak currently. Um, since he, I mean, that also counts the games before he got injured. Um, Cause he was red hot as well. Um, you know, that is, that is kind of the key. You do need that type of guy that can kind of just force the issue on offense, you know, just kind of, you know, swing away in a sense, you know, smart, but, um, yeah, you know, I, I, I agree with you guys for the most part. I I think, uh, I think the starting pitching does get a bad rap compared to what our offense does for me personally, though, it just feels like we can never get on the same page and do it on the same day ever. You know, I, I feel like, I feel like when we score a ton of runs, pitching falls apart. And then when we can't score runs, you know, pitching, pitching just kills it. You know what I mean? There's just no in between or like the starting pitching and the hitting will do great. And then the bullpen will come in and just, you know, fall off cliff. But hopefully we're done with that because Liam Hendricks stage four cancer just a few months ago. You know, that's, that's a situation where a lot of people aren't totally, they don't know how to react to that. You know, there's, there's not a lot of people who can fight that battle win it and god forbid you know not only return to a baseball field in a few months but you know maybe play baseball ever again liam hendricks just did it Mon- um you know obviously it was announced that he was returning to the team on uh monday against the uh against the angels um man w- what what more can you say about liam hendricks that hasn't already been said you know the story itself you know from from the top to bottom like it's just it's it's incredible stuff man it's it's perseverance it's uh, being able to uh, show your toughness. And, you know, a guy like Liam Hendricks, who has always shown, worn his emotions on his sleeve, um, you, you kind of thought going in that this is a guy, if anybody could do it, that he was going to knock it out of the park. And sure enough, he did, you know. And I, I I just can't say enough. I can't say enough about Liam. I'm just – I'm so happy for the guy. I'm so happy to see him back on a baseball field, you know, regardless of where this team is, regardless of where Liam is going to be pitching, you know, until he gets up to full speed, like – it's just incredible to see this guy back playing baseball. You know, the game is better when he's around. Um, the entire the entire league came together when they heard about this to really kind of support him. Um, I know major just all the media coverage on Monday was just incredible to watch. Just seeing everybody come out and show their appreciation for Liam Hendricks, and I'm just I'm just so glad to have him back. It's a bright spot in what's been a pretty rough season so far. And I think the natural thing will be, okay, let's watch him over the course of the next few weeks. How's his stuff look? How does he look as he gets back into that closer situation more often? 
Um, that's all the on-field stuff. The off-field stuff, as it rightly should be, is the focus right now. And, and him getting to this point is such a cool story of perseverance. Um, I can only imagine that there are plenty of people who are taking inspiration from his story, as they should be. Yeah, for sure. I think it's telling when, I mean, do kind of touched on this, how you see the entire league, you know, kind of celebrating and, and just showering Liam with so much well-deserved praise. And I also agree that we shouldn't really care about his performance too much, especially when it comes to like, oh, look at his velocity or look at his spin rates. Like, he's alive, he's pitching. It's just a huge win overall. And I think that just overall, when you look at what he's done for the last couple of years, he, he's huge for this team. He's huge in the locker room. And I think that will only be amplified now that he's back in there after going through what he's gone through, you know, he can serve as a source of strength for his teammates. And it's pretty much Liam Hendricks, pretty much the one thing about this team right now that pretty much makes me genuinely happy with no, you know, strings attached. Like they win a game and then something, you know, someone gets injured in it, or they, you know, have a great game and the next day they lose 10 to nothing. But Liam Hendricks just is the only one where you feel purely positive emotions. And that's definitely, you know, something worth celebrating. Yeah, I, I certainly know over over the last few years since Liam has been here, some of my favorite memories um, of going to Sox games during the summer is going going to a night game um, in a tight ball game and having the lights go out and the music start playing and Liam start running out to that mound, man. And it, it's just electric. You guys know exactly what I'm talking about. You know, it doesn't matter how many people are in that stadium. It doesn't matter, you know, where we are in the season. When Liam is running out of that bullpen, that place is an electric factory. And you know, I'm just I'm just getting goosebumps even talking about it because it's like one of my favorite, favorite things to see live in person. Um, and I just I cannot wait to get back down to the ballpark to see him pitch again. It's going to be incredible. You know, obviously, we'll all be able to see it on TV, but there's just something about that Liam Hendricks running out of that bullpen in a tight ball game. I, I don't know. It's just nothing beats that. Nothing beats that. I'm not going to get, I'm not going to get all emotional up here. So <laughs> Liam, it's great to have you back. Obviously I'm wearing the, uh, you know, close out cancer t-shirt. Obviously they're still selling them. Uh, White Sox charity's done a great job with that. I believe uh, we were, I believe the fan base raised about $104,000 for cancer research, which is just, that's incredible stuff. Nothing, no, nothing can top that. You know, it's just nice to have uh Liam Hendricks back. Um, that all being said, you know, outside of the great story of Liam Hendricks, where are we with this team? Are we in? Are we out? Are we kind of hovering in the middle? I kind of have my thoughts. Jordan, I'll let you I'll let you take the run on this. Are you in or out on the White Sox right now? I got I I before we got on this, I came in guns blazing on our like our pre-chat. I'm like, I'm out, I'm done, forget this. I still have one foot out the door. Like because the offense has shown absolutely zero improvement, I just don't see a way in which this is possible. Like th there's, there's not there on the pitching side, there's something to hang your hat on, but that can only last so long. I've got, uh, that's what's keeping me still in the door is the pitching staff and my enjoyment of watching Cease and Giolito. Um, at the same time, you got to make this decision rather soon right like th this is kind of the crux of kind of one of my issues with the white Sox for a very long time you know make your decision don't just sit here in this holding pattern because what happens is you know you got guys like roman gonzalez who's playing re really well recently give him the shot see what you've got in him see what you have in lennon sosa like just accept this team is what it is except elvis andrews isn't the answer and, and see what happens there uh, another good example, Sevi Zavala looks lost behind the plate. Like, shocker, the guy with a 404 BABIP as a catcher couldn't sustain it this year. Surprising, right? No, it just, he's a 30 year old backup catcher. See what you have in Carlos Perez. You know, Sevi Zavala is not the answer after Grandal this year. See what Perez can provide at a weak position around the league. He might be a starting catcher next year just because of how bad the rest of the league is at the catching position. Look at the free agents next year for catchers. They're terrible. So it's not like you're getting help there. Figure out what this team is. I'm teetering, so I'm kind of like hypocritical by saying I'm still teetering, but I am more towards this point of where you can figure out what you've got with certain guys so that once the season is finally determined, either they're in or they're out, they're retooling or they're going for it, you know what you have with your assets. And I, I've never felt like they're good at knowing 
especially those assets on the margins, they're never really good at knowing what they have. They end up having to put Coas out as the 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 uh, first right fielder for the season, or they only put Gonzalez in um, every once in a while. They only put Sosa in every once in a while. Like they don't find out what they have on the margins very well, so they can't go out and spend on those things if they like. Oh, it might be in house, but we're not really sure yet, so we have to still figure it out. Like. You can still be in on this. I guess that's my point. You can still be in right now while still figuring out what you've got long term with certain guys, especially behind the plate and at second base. Like, figure out what you've got because you really only got two more weeks, three more weeks before you got to decide. Like, this is either it or we're going to go for it. Yeah, I agree. I mean, Sebi Zavala on that point has a 13 uh, weighted runs created plus and a 190 on base percentage. Like, I understand that the pitchers like throwing to him, but even Martin Maldonado, the guy people like to point to as an example of a catcher who provides no offense, even he is like four times as valuable on offense. Like you need to be a Hall of Fame level defensive catcher to have Sebi Zavala stats. And even then that might not be enough. So I totally agree with you there, Jordan. And um, as for are you in or out on this team, I'm kind of in the same place I was back when we first started talking about this question when they were seven and 21, like, I don't really care how many games back the team is, like when they were five games back with Minnesota, if they're 10 games under 500. Like, I'm going to need them to at least get to 500 before I'm actually thinking, wow, this could be a division winner. No matter how bad the division is, I really don't think that the division winner is going to be like 77 and 85 or something. So that's kind of where I'm at. I think that it would be great to see a prolonged streak, kind of the reverse of what they had in April, like a 20 and five stretch. I mean, obviously everybody would be out at that point, but. That's kind, of, that's kind of what I need because the holes are so deep. And like Jordan said, I'm not really seeing much improvements make me think that they're back, so to speak. Like the offense will have a good game and then have four bad ones. So until I see something consistently, I'm kind of with Jordan where I'm like mostly out the door. But like maybe like it's it's possible. It's just unlikely. So I can't say I'm out just because they kind of did what I wanted them to do after the first month because of, of how bad the first month was. I wanted them to just win some series fairly consistently, which I feel like they've done a pretty good job of doing. You know, I know that Detroit series really is sticking in our heads and it, it's because it was awful and we should have beaten Detroit. There's absolutely no excuse behind that. You know, I genuinely don't think Detroit's all that good. Um, I think the record's inflated, but I'm not going to sit here and shit on Detroit when, you know, I'm a White Sox fan. Um, but I, I really do think if we continue in this direction to continue winning more games than we're losing, and I know that's a crazy concept, I think we can still sneak around and mess around in this division. I really do believe that that's how bad this this division is. And, you know, I hate to, you know, be, you know, go around the idea of like, oh, well, we, in the div- we win the division, we're in the playoffs, and, uh, yeah, we get clapped in the first round. Yeah. You know? Oh, man baseball is a crazy sport you know I, I we've, we've seen crazier things happen you know i'm not gonna sit here and say we're gonna be the washington nationals you know because that's probably not gonna happen you know I'm, I'm i'm a realist on top of it but i really do think that if we continue to just play good baseball and let things fall where they fall you know who knows man if we can stay competitive in the al central all we need is a ticket to the dance you know what i mean are, are we gonna last more than one round who knows probably not um, but I, I do think that if we're just looking at based on winning this division, I think I think we're still very much in the conversation. And I think we've shown in this last month that we are not the team that was playing in April. And that right now is enough for me. Um, am I going to want to see a pretty nice winning streak here at some point to kind of really, you know, put put everything back in gear? Absolutely. You know, sitting 10 games under is 500 is brutal and I hate it. But, you know. I see us moving in the right direction. They did what I asked of them. Now I'm just going to need them to do it on a little bit more of a consistent basis, handle business in the central. Absolutely. Like we cannot afford to drop any more series in the central. Um, And if we are going to lose a series, make it competitive, give us something going out of it, you know, anything, just momentum. Um, But yeah, no, I'm, I'm not out. I'm, I'm almost, I'm almost there, but they did what I asked them to do when we were at our absolute lowest. So that's all I can ask. But um, anyway, I think that is a good spot, uh, good spot for a stop. We covered a little bit of everything over the past week. Um, so that is all we have for the Sox on 35th podcast. Be sure to subscribe to the podcast on Apple, Spotify, YouTube, and everywhere else you get your podcasts. 
Also, be sure to check out the website at SoxOn35th.com, as well as following us on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram at SoxOn35th to stay up to date with your Chicago White Sox. This has been Duke Coughlin, joined as always by Jordan Lazowski and Nick Gower. We will be back next week as we cover another week of White Sox baseball. Thank you and go Sox! Go Sox! Go Sox! Go Sox!